what is the word they're looking for? Like screw being realistic, like dream big, be bold. Like, you know, the world has never been at a choice point like this. You know, the climate crisis demands so much change of the world around us, like in our economic system, in our communities, in our energy, in our homes, in our agriculture, in our fashion, in every single part of the world. So like, if you have some dream and everyone around you says that it's not possible or everyone around you, including yourself, says that, no, but that would be nice, but you know, you can't really do that. Or, you know, the world isn't like that. This is just the way the world is. You need to just, you know, forget about that. Don't listen to that. Like go in on it, follow it, trust it. And it will take longer than you think, but you know, believe in it enough to keep going. And I think that that is such an important message to have in the world today, you know, to follow what's yours isn't easy. It's, I'm not guaranteeing this is an easy path or a painless path, but it is, ultimately a needed path and remembering that is as you namaste beautiful souls i'm shilpa and you're tuned into the omni mindfulness podcast a sanctuary for spiritual entrepreneurs as a holistic mindfulness coach and social marketing strategist i'm here to guide you on a transformative journey on this show we explore captivating stories and provide practical tools that deepen your connection with your authentic self through the personal and professional narratives of remarkable individuals we expand our consciousness and ignite the spark of possibility. Each season, I curate content that empowers you to create a holistic lifestyle encompassing spirituality, mindfulness, energy awareness, and mindset. Join me as we engage in conversations with experts in their respective fields and share solo casts from yours truly, all aimed at supporting you and relaxing, revitalizing, resetting your body, mind, and spirit. I'm your host and the visionary behind Omni Mindfulness. So what if just one story had the power to shift the trajectory of your life? What if you could become an instrument in helping others realize their true selves? And what if your soul's higher purpose lies in experiencing the joy of Omni Mindfulness? Remember, it's never too late to rewrite your story. Welcome to Season 7 as we embark on an, an exhilarating journey into energy awareness. In July, we explore the driving forces that fuel the lives of my guests, uncovering their passion and purpose. In August... We delve into the profound connection between somatic movement and vitality. And finally, in September, we explore holistic awareness where mind, body, and spirit unite for transformative experiences. Stay tuned for insightful conversations, expert guests, and tools to cultivate conscious energy awareness. So let's dive into the season of energy awareness together. My next guest personifies passion and purpose. Laura Hartley is an activist, coach, and founder of Public Love Enterprises, an online school empowering change makers to radically reimagine the world, creating the conditions for social healing and collective thriving. Laura is fascinated by the space between inner and outer change, and her work empowers change makers to get free dismantling capitalism and oppressive systems from the inside out. She runs programs in healing burnout culture, regenerative leadership, and finding your purpose in a changing world. And now, here is Laura. Well, hi, Laura. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Hello. Such an honor. I'm so excited. I've read up on so many aspects of what you're doing currently, and I thought this would be a great topic as it relates to passion and purpose. Absolutely. Um, and that's what I'm excited to be here today and to talk about. Wonderful. Maybe we take a step back and you share your journey, um, where you're at, even where you are, where you are at geographically, as far as where you're at in your life, in your journey. 
Absolutely. So I am currently living in Toronto, Canada, but if you can hear my accent, I'm originally from Sydney, Australia. So I'm an activist, a coach, and I run an online school for change makers. And I have always been passionate about this idea of change, both like internal change in our inner worlds and the agency that we have, but also externally, like how do we change the world? How do we create, you know, a more just world, a more regenerative world, um, something that's a little bit more beautiful and inclusive for people to live in. And, you know, both of these, this love of change, I think kind of stems back to my upbringing. You know, I grew up in a house that was surrounded by personal development and by coaching. My mother was a coach, but she also ran one of the first life coach training schools in Australia a few decades ago. And so, you know, all the time I was hearing, oh gosh, everybody from like Neil Donald Walsh to Wayne Dyer to Dennis Waitley, like many, many different thinkers when I was young. And, you know, I think this taught me from a young age that I had a sense of agency and I had an appreciation for our inner world and the gifts that we carry. But, you know, as I grew older and as passionate as I was about this work and as much as it's helped me immensely over my own life, I also saw some of the struggles that existed within personal development and self-work that, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful tools, but at the same time, doesn't necessarily have an answer for racism or sexism or climate change. And so as an activist, I'm really curious about how do we start to bridge these worlds? You know, what is the inner work that we need to do to actually create a more beautiful world? How do we start to look at this idea of wider system change and the inner work that we need to do to free ourselves mentally, you know, in our beliefs, in our mindsets, in our values of the world as it is. So these are the kind of spaces that have drawn me to where I am today and to running the online school for change makers. You know, I believe each and every one of us has something to offer in this time. Each and every one of us has something we can give to the world and has a role to play in remaking it. And that's just a really exciting space to be in. I find it fascinating that you described that while the inner work is incredible, like the Wayne Dyers and allowing yourself to become I would say a new version or improved version of yourself, but that doesn't always answer the situations around us as humans, the, the humanity of um, what we experience. So that, that is good that you recognize that that's a reality. Yeah, you know, and I think it goes two ways, you know, so as an activist, sometimes I also feel that we can be overly focused on policy change and external change and missing the underlying cultural wounds that have led to the world as it is, that each and every one of us can be a part of remaking. But I, I often say that, you know, self-help without a collective liberation lens, without a vision that includes the justice, love and belonging for all of us, you know, it's often just capitalism in disguise. Like we become very focused on just like fixing and just getting the next thing done. And how can we be a bit better rather than actually, what does it mean to really create thriving communities and thriving lives and to feel a sense of wholeness and fulfillment for each of us? Do you believe that given the catalyst of what um, COVID did for the world, that that shifted people's perception of the importance of community? I don't like to think so. But yes and no. I think COVID was a wonderful catalyst for also to teaching us how quickly and how rapidly we can change. I think it taught us about interconnection, like nothing else before, that what happens in one place affects us somewhere else, that there is no us in them. You know, there's no humans in the natural world either. You know, it, we are all of it and we are all together. But I also think that you know, we've sometimes missed the opportunities and the gifts associated with COVID, you know, and those were exactly what you're saying. How can we create stronger communities? How can we um, take this message and really use the fact that we can change quickly and radically into really redesigning our systems for the flourishing of all? So I'm a little bit of a yes and no. I think it taught us great things. I think some places came out of it with wonderful gifts. And I think also sometimes we've missed those lessons. Um, and we may need to learn them again. And what kind of lessons do you feel that are now relevant, given that with hindsight or, you know, like with perspective of where the world is at now? Mm, that is a good question. 
So, you know, where my work kind of centers around is, you know, I'm very passionate about looking at a systems based lens when we're looking at the world. We're looking at capitalism, we're looking at patriarchy, any of these systems, all of them, white supremacy included, have a mindset and have a belief attached to them. They have a set of values that uphold them and perpetuate them. And so for me, the lesson that I think we probably haven't really learned, um, but that we're learning as we do, as we go, is how do we start to work with the energy of the system? How do we start to work with the mindset of the system and start to really unravel it within ourselves? You know, we've often had a very binary view of change, that it's either just what I do on the inside and like I can, you know, free myself and, you know, enlightenment and liberation and, you know, this a wonderful thing but the kind of external world is missed. Or we've been very, very engaged in changing the world, but missing the ways that those systems play out in us, as us, and through us. So I think the lesson of this time is in learning to bridge the two, in learning to use self-work for world work, to see the two as interconnected, to understand that you know our personal liberation and enlightenment is never complete if people in the world are not free to express themselves authentically and as they are. So this two-way lens is is the lesson I think of the current moment. Yes, absolutely. I recall at the beginning of COVID, a friend of mine um, who is uh, a very much of a yogi and someone made a comment on his Facebook saying, well, you, you're a yogi, why are you so worked up about all these things around the world and events? And he's like, well, I'm connected, you know? Yeah, well, because again, there's just sometimes it's like, there are some really, you know, I consider them a little slightly bit toxic, some teachings within the personal development world that kind of says, you know, you create everything that you experience. And I don't agree with that. I, nobody chooses war and nobody chooses racism. Nobody chooses disease, but we have agency over how we respond. Yes, absolutely. You know, there's this idea that all of this is an illusion, but that completely kind of negates the suffering that people genuinely experience day to day, you know, it negates our own suffering you know, the own grief and illness and pain and trauma that we've all been through. So this idea that somehow, you know, the world is separate to our inner worlds and that it's only about what's happening inside of us. And if we can control that, nothing matters on the outside. I think we lose the love and the beauty and the magic of being part of the world, right? Because like all of us right here, like this is a wonderful time to be alive in. You know, we have more opportunity than ever. We have more creativity than ever. We have more tools than ever. You know, this is an incredible point in time to be alive, to connect with the world and to say, I love it. And I want to do something to be a part of it and to be part of it. It's remaking. Yes. There's always this um, period where sometimes I can speak for myself that I want to become more withdrawn because it's just too much out there. But other times I'm like, it's, it's so wonderful. And just finding that happy medium, <laughs> that's yeah. not easy. It's not like I actually I really think being like so as much as I say it's a wonderful opportunity to be alive today it's also not easy you know we are exposed every day in every moment anybody who has a phone and you know has the internet on it to all of the crises in the world and that is overwhelming you know and so finding this space to have a practice that returns us from our need to fix the world and into our desire to love it into our work and practice of loving it, that for me is the space to be in because it has such a different energy and allows us to have also the love and compassion for ourselves that we need to be alive in this time as well. I, what I'm hearing also from you is that by connecting to others, that is a form of service. And by serving others, you're really, uh, it's like serving the collective energy that you're a part of. Yes. Absolutely. You know, and like all of this work is based on spiritual teachings, you know, and one of the greatest spiritual teachings that there is, is this idea of service. Mm -hmm. And for me, expanding our idea of service to ask, how can I love the world? What does loving the world look like in my community, in my organization, in my workplace, in my family? That is a powerful question. It's service-based, it's regenerative. It gives us a place to stay with long haul work that isn't all about, you know, this kind of us versus them dynamic or like this like big problem that's impossible to solve and it's overwhelming you know it gives us something that is renewable and foundational and you know key to being human and creating a better world and that does 
provide the opportunity to change the narrative on what we think of as us versus them as opposed to service. And at the end of the day, everyone needs to eat a meal or breathe air or just be held. Yeah. Look, the the us versus them kind of mentality that exists, you know, is part of an ideology of separation that exists in the world. Like there is a strong unconscious belief that we all carry in our separation. And that plays out in many different ways. You know, it plays out as us versus them, it plays out um, in this kind of paradigm of domination and hierarchy a bit. It plays out in the humans in the natural world is the big one. Like, you know, somehow we're separate from the environment and it's fine because, you know, we can fly to Mars uh, and start, start a new life there. Like, that, you know, we're not of the world. And so all of these beliefs in our separation, um, you know, when we haven't unpacked them and we haven't explored the ways that they're showing up in our lives, in our mindsets, then they often result in us feeling powerless, right? We feel like, who am I to make a change? Like, it's too big. Like, you know, I'm one person and the problem is so big. It's all the way over there and I'm over here. And what am I supposed to do? And of course, that feeling of powerlessness further cements in the world as it is. It cements in the ideology of separation. So this really, this returning to community, returning to service, returning to our collective values and our collective work is is such a powerful way through that. How can one start on a micro level? Because like you were saying, if, if there's something happening, say, in Ukraine, and I feel sad or um, frustrated for someone when I hear a story. Of course, I can't fly out there, but there's probably something each of us is able to do on a daily micro level. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like from a practical point of view, I would probably be like, okay, there are options of really amazing. I'm not a big fan of like the big NGOs because often they're not that effective, but there are small on the ground organizations that you can support and that you get engaged with. But I would also be asking something a little bit deeper, which is, you know, if that is the cause that is speaking to you, why is that? What are you feeling as a result of what you're seeing? And what is the suffering and the struggle that you're seeing? And why are you empathizing with that? And then where can you start to find that and help that and serve that also in your own community? Because very often, you know, that suffering is not unique just to another part of the world. It's happening right here around us. So how can we start to tune into it, to question it, to go a little bit deeper, to question our intentions, to see whether we've got a little bit of that fixing or saving mentality going on? um, And where can we channel it into love for the world in action, in our own lives, day to day? That's interesting. I know that a lot of the women that listen to this podcast, they probably have a variety of things that they are passionate about when it comes to the extended version of humanity, what is going on outside, what they think is outside. But like you were saying, if there's a catalyst, there's a trigger, there's probably, there's a reason for that trigger. And there's so many things that one can care about and be involved in on a more community level. And I, I find that absolutely correct. I've seen that Even with past guests, I had a friend who was on who would talk about just even recycling and recycling on a micro level to help with environmental issues. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that's an entry point. I think understanding, you know, when we can start to look at the idea of, you know, systems playing out through us and as us, we can also start to challenge them. So like when we start to understand that there is a mindset to capitalism, you know, it says that we always need to be having more, this desire of infinite growth, that you haven't done enough because it's fundamentally based on scarcity, even more so than greed. Many people think it's a system of greed, it's a system of scarcity. So how do we internalize that? And in that work that we're doing within ourselves to, to, to stop demonizing ourselves for being lazy, to give ourselves rest, to embrace pleasure, to step away from the mindset of capitalism is serving the world. And I would dare say it's actually one of the greatest things that we can do in terms of climate action, um, in terms other than obviously like protest, lobbying our politicians, divest from fossil fuels, you know, is actually kind of freeing ourselves from the mindset of capitalism, freeing ourselves from the mindset of patriarchy, which is a mindset of shaming. You know, it's very much based on gendered power and it leverages shame for power. So what are the ways that we as women all the time are perfectionists, we've experienced imposter syndrome, we feel like we've never done enough, we criticize ourselves. And 
we perpetuate that system because we've internalized it. So when we're looking at any system in the world, if we want to make deep change, the self-work that we are doing is one of the most important things that we can do. It's not, it, it's not an either or, like it's both and at the same time. And the work that we do to free ourselves of those mindsets will also lead us into deeper and more intentional and greater action. I am very visual. And when you were describing what you were describing, I had not only goosebumps and I could feel it, but I, I also could see visually like a diagram of a human with they're doing this internal work that's connecting to the head and then the heart and then taking that energy and then extending it almost like on a cellular level with other um, sentient beings around them. And that like when you work on yourself, you're essentially working on helping others as well. Yeah, well, this I think I love that expression of like, you know, head, heart, and hands, because like it's only when we're engaging all three that I think we're really in alignment with service and really in alignment with you know, creating more justice and more uh, more love in the world. So that how are we understanding like in our head systems, how are we using our brain and using our mind to to really question the world? To, you know, to think critically about the world as it is, how are we using our heart in service, how are we connecting the two and really starting to love ourselves, love others, free ourselves of these really toxic systems that we live in, how, and then how are we using our hands in action and taking all that we've learned and all that we're practicing outward. Because if we're only working on the inner dimension and we're not taking our practice outside of us, we are missing half the picture. And if we're only working outside and we're not also looking within, then we're only kind of tweaking the edges. We're not creating real transformation. So yeah, I love that kind of analogy that you use there of how we are uh, spreading it from the inside to the out. Yes. And this metaphor then ties back to the very conversation we're having about passion and purpose, because that passion is something that it may be ignited on the inside as energetic desire, but it may turn into purpose once you've done that inner work on yourself, but it's, it's a daily thing. It is. It is like, we often think of this as like, you know, one big moment when I've discovered my purpose or one big moment when it's like this ball of passion and it's beautiful. Um, and like those moments when they do happen are great. Like everybody like knows one or two of those moments, I think, and we love them, but they're also not sustainable. You know, it's really the day to day work that we're doing. And here's the thing, I think each and every single one of us has a gift to offer the world. Each and every single one of us has something that we are supposed to be doing in this time. So figuring out what it is that we love, what it is that we feel called to, that there are frameworks that can help us understand our role in the world and that it should leave us feeling good. We shouldn't be exhausted and burnt out and stressed and wondering how we're going to keep up and can I keep doing this? You know, we should be thriving then, you know, these are very, uh, you know, natural and experiences that start to occur when we have the right conditions and we're doing that day-to-day -day work that we need to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. So the work of passion, the work of purpose, it's, it, it's, it's a constant dynamic cycle of internal work that is then extended externally, but that over time, what is what you consider external isn't necessarily external. It perhaps we are changing our mindset or perception of what is outside of us and inside of us. Does that absolutely? Make it does. You know, I think I think following the little callings within us. You know, those, those little voices that each and every single one of us has that say yes, this 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 speaks to me. That we are so conditioned not to follow. Again, like, and there are reasons for this, but women in particular, we are conditioned not to follow these because they all uphold the world as it is as soon as we ignore them. Then, you know, when we do, it's liberating. When we do, there is something, there's a magic within that. And that magic is going to help us both personally in our own lives, but also help the world, I believe, because the two are always connected. We're always connected. Now, I, another thing that came to my mind was you mentioned how women often feel. And I can see for myself that that not being good enough or imposter syndrome is so true. And particularly just raising the bar, like that masculine energy, like I have to do more. I'm not checking off all the marks. And it just, it, it goes on, it just, the narrative just keeps going on and on to the point where sometimes I can barely get out of bed if I overthink it. Yes. 
And, you know, here's the thing, we frame burnout and perfectionism as kind of, you know, you problems or us problems in our culture. And that's because we live in a culture that loves to individualize systemic problems. It's like, this is a big system problem, but it's like, no, that's you. That's you over there. Or that's them. That's their problem. It's because of them. None of this is true. These are system problems. But when we don't know that and we blame ourselves, we only have an inward lens. And that means there's definitely going to be some benefits that we can find from that. You know, perfectionism in particular and imposter syndrome also has roots in trauma, in childhood, in family dynamics, but it also has roots in culture. So in learning to change our lens into this kind of 360 direction of looking both outward and inward, we can start to actually ask questions like, well, who benefits when I feel this way? And usually, you know, I think as women, we often answer that with like, well, nobody benefits, okay? I'm holding myself back and I feel small and shamed and I keep thinking about this idea, but I never start it. And nobody benefits. And I don't think that's true. People do benefit. The status quo benefits. The world as it is benefits. Systems like patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy all benefit. So the only way, so there are people who are benefiting. Then asking, well, who loses? Okay, what misses out when I don't act from this space? And then starting to ask questions of, you know, once we've started to do this kind of analysis of where is the system playing into this, of what would feel liberatory in this moment? You know, how do I actually step out of my head and out of this kind of thinking that is keeping us trapped in these systems and into something that is more regenerative, into something that is freeing? What would that look like? What would I do? So it's creating this dual lens that says these problems are not just us, okay? And if they were, you wouldn't have half the world burnt out. If they were, you wouldn't have almost every woman that I think most of us know feeling like they're never quite doing enough or like they're not quite good enough or doubting themselves because it happens all of the time. And so we need to realize it's not us and it is the system. And so therefore it's our work to start to get free. Oh, I I just love that point you made. And again, it might be more subtle and I may not necessarily articulate it the way I want to, but I feel that What you're also saying is having this new lens, having the capability of going inward also will shift your ability to know what your purpose and passion is. Yes, absolutely. Well, because here's the thing, like we are, we all have like our authentic desires and our authentic truth. And then we have cultural conditioning and the cultural conditioning comes from family, comes from religion, comes from schools, comes from just culture in general and all of the media that we consume. And, you know, that manifests in us as shoulds, you know, every time we say, you know, I don't want to do this thing, but I should, or I wish I could do that, but you know, I shouldn't. And so every time we have a should or a shouldn't, we can usually tie it back to cultural conditioning. And that is a great lesson there that we can start to unpack. But really tapping into our sense of authenticity. So stepping out of the frame of, I can't do this. I'm not enough. I haven't done enough. I'm not good enough, whatever it might be. And into this feels true. This feels exciting. This feels real, authentic, liberatory, freeing, whatever it might be. It might be something that's a little bit different. It might change our passions. It might change the direction that we want to go in. Because if we haven't examined what is true for us, then we're often just following what we think we're supposed to do, all those things we should do, you know, rather than actually, this is actually what I want to do. Does this feel good? Like, yeah, it does. Great. Does it go against everything that I've been taught that I should do by my family and by my society? Yes. But I'm going to do it anyway. And that's a powerful space to be in. And that ties back to what you and I initially were discussing, that there's the internal work, and it's there for a purpose, but that alone is not enough. And there's external conditions of that where we respond to the world, and we're participating in it. But that can't happen in isolation to the internal work, because often what I've seen in society growing up, now that I've been on the planet for quite some time, is that that the lens people have on the inside often might have already been um, tainted by society and then not even being aware. So yeah, because here's yeah, go ahead. yeah, like we all grow up, I think, knowing what our authentic needs and desires are at a very young age. We're all born that way. You know, like babies know what they need. They know what they want. You know, toddlers know what they need and know what they want. But somewhere along the way, usually and at different ages, different stages for different people for different reasons, we get taught you can't have what you want. 
and what you want or who you are or what you're being right now, what you're feeling right now is bad, that it's not desirable. Um, and you know, what replaces that conditioning, what replaces our authentic truths and what replaces our, our authentic desires is the conditioning of culture. And that is the reality is in most of us, the conditioning of, you know, a white supremacist, patriarchal capitalist society. Mm -hmm. And that is all based on scarcity, based on shame and based on separation. And so unpacking that, you know, really does lead us sometimes to different places, but that is the work of change, right? That is the work of realizing that exactly what we said before, you can't just look inward and not look outward to culture. And you cannot just look outward and not look at the ways that we uphold the system or we participate in it or the work we have to do in the world ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it is this middle ground that we're starting to explore. The middle ground, absolutely. And Another concept that comes to my mind is the word of um, the concept of empathy or compassion and recognizing that when we start really doing that internal work and then recognizing our role with others, it could start with something as simple as smiling at someone. Yeah. And not assuming we understand their journey or their struggles or their stories. Yes, this work of really starting, I think, to realize that everybody has a story and everybody is going through something and we don't know what that is, yes. you know, and to start to realize there's many different ways of being human there's, and each is perfectly valid, you know, each is unique and different and, and that's okay. There is no one path. There is thousands, millions, billions of different paths that each of us are walking. And so just developing that sense of, you know, how can I you know, really embody my values in this moment? What would compassion do in this moment in my thoughts and my words and my actions? Mm -hmm. What would that look like when I direct it towards myself as well as externally? Because values are always two ways. You know, it's never just inward or outward. And that's a beautiful place to start to work when we don't know where to begin. And we want to start really uh, exploring our role in the world. And starting with compassion is an absolutely a really important place that we can begin. Yes, yes. I mean, having been raised with um, a Hindu culture in America in the 70s, I was constantly dueling what I consider, oh, what is right, you know, but over time with the spiritual work that I've done to understand my authentic self, I realize now that there are different ways, there are different paths there are. And that's the thing, like, I, you know, we are so taught that there is one way that the world can be. Mm -hmm. um, and that's particularly in kind of, in, in kind of, uh, in, in Western cultures, like at the moment, I'm in Canada or the US, Australia, you know, that this kind of capitalist notion um, of hyper individualism of, you know, it's a dog eat dog world of it's us versus them. And like, you've just got to belong and fit in is a really crippling story, I think. I think it really, it stunts our authenticity. I think it, it does, it certainly doesn't foster belonging or love or connection or humanity. And, you know, for us personally, we suffer because a lot of the time, the things that we're interested in, the things that we're passionate about, the purpose that we have in the world is not in alignment with necessarily the dominant story of culture. And so mm -hmm. understanding that there's a dominant story of culture and that going against it doesn't always feel easy or comfortable um you know but it it does often feel liberating and good even if it's not comfortable I should say you know is a it's a journey and a process I I just so enjoyed that point you just made what can someone who's just new to all of this um who's just maybe a female entrepreneur who's trying to find her way and she's like thinking well society tells me I've gone this education or my culture, like I can, I can speak for myself. I was raised um, with this notion that, oh, by X age, you have to have been married. By this age, you should have done this. I, I unfortunately didn't do anything that was asked of me. <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> it I is the way. <laughs> I went against the grain all the time. But um, I know there are generations of women or different pockets of women around the world who would like to um, step out of what is considered the boundaries and what advice would you give them or what guide guidance 
Mm. So I think, first of all, I think some of the best people are the people that haven't followed traditional paths, you know, because I think at least are, you know, more interesting and, you know, kind of exciting choices, right? So mm. yeah, absolutely. If you haven't followed the traditional path, that is a wonderful thing. That's a good thing. Great. You know, that means that you're following what is true for you. Um, but I think asking these questions as well of like, well, is that true? You know, like, oh, I should have been married by now. I should have met somebody by now, or my business should have been in a better place by now. Is that true? You know, and is that 100% without a doubt true? I think Byron Katie has some wonderful work in that space, you know, of the work and asking those questions. And that gives us a bit of insight and a little bit of a reflection point to actually start to maybe step away from that story and step away from that pain that might be attached to it, that I'm not good enough or, or whatever it is that's kind of happening there. The other thing I would say, especially, especially to like female entrepreneurs, you know, is that now is the time and, you know, I, I won't swear on this show, but, um, you know, like kind of, what is the word I'm looking for? Like screw being realistic, like dream big, be bold. Like, you know, the world has never been at a choice point like this. You know, the climate crisis demands so much change of the world around us, like in our economic system, in our communities, in our energy, in our homes, in our agriculture, in our fashion, in every single part of the world. So like, if you have some dream and everyone around you says that it's not possible or everyone around you, including yourself, says that oh, well, that would be nice, but, you know, you can't really do that. Or, you know, the world isn't like that. This is just the way the world is. You need to just, you know, forget about that. Don't listen to that. Like, go in on it. Follow it. Trust it. And it will take longer than you think. But, you know, believe in it enough to keep going. And I think that that is such an important message to have in the world today. You know, to follow what's yours isn't easy. It's I'm not guaranteeing this is an easy path or a painless path, but it is ultimately a needed path and remembering that as as you're on your way forward that is such a uplifting point that you just made I mean I need to hear it all the time so me too <laughs> you know this is the thing I think for anybody who's like really looking to do something different right and and particularly again for women starting their own businesses because you know we don't see women as the traditional um, you know, model of success and a lot of us wanting to do business in a different way as well. You know, like for me, I'm really like invested in well, what does an anti-capitalist business look like? What does a feminist business look like? And so starting to do things outside of the norm takes courage, you know, it takes creativity and it takes a little bit of perseverance, but it is ultimately, I think, very rewarding. Absolutely. It is very rewarding. And there's so many interconnected um, missions that I feel like I have and I believe that there's overlap with other women it's sure I am here to support mindfulness and female entrepreneurs but I have um, platforms that I love like climate control yes exactly like and you know for Again, my passion is in like, we often think we need to pick one corner of the world, right? And just do that. But like, I love bridging two worlds, mindfulness, spirituality, inner work saved my life. I am always going to be an advocate for every form of inner work there is, whether it is going to therapy, whether it's meditation, whether it's plant medicine, go explore yourself. But then I'm also you know, an advocate for like, hey, let's dismantle capitalism and patriarchy and remake the world. And the more of us who can start to then do this work of actually bridging the two things that we're passionate about, that it's okay to be a multifaceted person, it, it, brings, it brings courage and gifts. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not, it's not, we're not taught that. So it is an unlearning, I think, to really embrace it in ourselves. And that's one of the reasons I, one of the many reasons I left corporate is that from the get-go, I should have had the, the very conversations I'm listening, people will listen to with you and I having this conversation, that you, you might be one of those people who will do your own thing better. and. You're multifaceted and it's okay to be multifaceted because I recognize early on, but didn't, um, I didn't fight it then, but what I recognized early on was most people in the certain parts of the world still want to pigeonhole you. They want to put you in a box. They want to label the box and then they want to put the box on a shelf and refer to you as that thing up there. Yes. 
Absolutely. And, you know, even just remembering that there's different uh, roles and, and spaces that we can be taking. So like, as an example, like one of the frameworks that I use in helping people find what's theirs and remaking the world is looking at this idea of being a disruptor, an aider or a builder. So disruptors are, you know, very naturally inclined to go into activist movements, journalism, law, because it's all about shining a light on injustice. And, you know, it's a very powerful space to be, but it's all about kind of halting the world as it is in its tracks. Now, a lot of people are trying to do that work in organizations that are not natural disruptors because they see the injustice and they say, well, that shouldn't be happening and we could do better. And let me try to stop this. But instead, they're actually better suited to either like the aiding roles, which are like, you know, how are we imp helping people impacted by injustice? So like a lot of nonprofit workers, conservationists, nurses, healers, artists, but also builders, because for every single time that we think that we're stopping something in the world, we also need to be building something. So a lot of the time I spent time certainly in corporate gigs years ago, you know, saying, OK, but hey, like, you know, the way this is done, this could be so much better. Like, you know, we could do it like this. And the bureaucracy and the like, you know, the the yes, no, push, pull and then like the office politics. And it was just like, this is not serving me or serving the world, but I am a natural builder. So then it's like, well, how can I build the structures, build the systems, build the communities that we need to be actually be creating um, as part of this time? And so discovering that there's a framework, that there's places that each of us sit also gives us, uh, I think, a more imaginative space to work from. Because if I had... And of course, there's crossover between all of these. But if I only stay in the space of aiding or I only stay in the space of, of disrupting and I'm not actively building as part of my work and as part of my mission, then, you know, I'm kind of selling myself and my dreams and my passion and my purpose short. Yeah. So what you're speaking to um, sounds like archetypes. You're understanding your archetype and then recognizing that you're multifaceted but really leaning into that knowledge to guide you, navigate. Absolutely. It's change maker archetypes. You know, I hadn't actually used that word in this context, but yes, that is what it is. There's different archetypes for us as a change maker. Yes. And we can start to lean in and discover a bit about them and, you know, the different strengths and the different challenges that they all have, the different inner work that each of them requires and help guide us kind of on our path. That is wonderful. And I, I really do believe that that can really become instrumental in helping others in defining their passion and purpose yeah absolutely because it, again it gives us a space to go you know what I have been I've spent 20 years in a nonprofit, um trying to help people and I'm actually I, I really feel like this isn't for me anymore it was great once but it's not for me and actually I'm so tired of fighting systems that don't change that I want to focus on the building or I want to focus actively on what disruption could look like. And so it gives us a space to start to just explore again and discover new kind of passions and new ways of making meaning out of this world and new things we want to do. That is wonderful. How can someone who's listening to this um, reach out to you and say, you know, she described these different, uh, I would say, archetype models. And I, I would be curious how I can apply it to myself. and also. Can you share a little bit more about your organization, the name yeah. of it, and just how people can learn more about that as well? And I'll put it in the show notes, but nonetheless, maybe you can explain it. Of course. So I called my business Public Love Enterprises, which is really based on the idea that I think love should be a public good and that we would benefit from exploring love in our public spaces much more than we do. So my website is laurahartley.com, though. You can find all of my work there, uh, including my coaching options. So I work with people both in regenerative leadership coaching, but also like coaching around burnout and perfectionism. I run regular online courses uh, and free workshops all the time. So you can find me at laurahartley.com. I'm on Instagram at laura.h.hartley. And I'm also on, in on LinkedIn, if that is your space. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely. A lot of women that are professional women uh, are on LinkedIn as well. So I will have that and I hope I can bring you back again because you touched upon so many things that I could just easily talk another hour on. Ditto. I love this conversation. I love your show. So I'm always happy to come back. And it's been so much fun kind of uh, to have this to have this talk today. Wonderful, Laura. Well, have a great day. And I'm definitely going to have you back. Maybe we can talk about one of my passions is um, the, the environment. Yes, absolutely.
Absolutely. Mine too. Perfect. Wonderful. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, sweet soul. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would be so grateful for your kind review on Apple Podcast. Simply click on the link in the show notes to leave your lovely feedback and uplift our spirits. Your support means the world to me and helps our show thrive. So please show me your love and continue to practice Omni Mindfulness.